And now, please welcome the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Chief Richard Berry, Chief of the University of Central Florida Police Department. Good afternoon. It's my privilege to call to order the second General Assembly of the 2015 Annual Conference and Exposition of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Unfortunately, Attorney General Loretta Lynch was scheduled to join us today, but cannot attend. This year, in a break from tradition, the centerpiece of our second General Assembly will be a moderated forum to discuss critical issues. We can all agree that policing today is under more scrutiny than ever before. Our jobs require more understanding, more community engagement, and greater awareness. We're about to set a precedent for the IACP General Assemblies, moving away from our tried and true single speaker format to an interactive panel discussion focused on urgent policing issues. In a few minutes, the panel will join us. The panelists include the President and Chief Executive Officer of the NAACP, Dr. Cornell Brooks, Kathy O'Toole, Chief of Police from Seattle, Washington, Will Johnson, Chief of Police from Arlington, Texas, and Vanita Gupta, Acting Assistant Attorney General, Office of Civil Rights, United States Department of Justice. This will be led by our moderator, Dr. Lori Friedell. They will engage, <laughs> I'm betting, in a very lively discussion on a topic that's been at the forefront and all our thoughts for months community police relations. We thought that having a dialogue on this issue amongst a very diverse group of leaders made a world of sense, and that it would be significant value to everyone in attendance. As we move into the panel discussion portion of the General Assembly, I want to personally introduce our moderator, Dr. Lori Friedell. Dr. Friedell is a nationally known and respected police and justice researcher currently serving as a faculty member of the Criminology Department at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Prior to joining USF, she served for six years as the Director of Research at the Police Executive Research Forum in Washington, D.C. Dr. Friedell has over 30 years of experience conducting research on law enforcement, including police use of force, violence against the police, and police deviance. She is also an expert on biased policing. She has authored, co-authored, or edited eight books on these topics. Working with and for the United States Department of Justice, the COPS Office, Dr. Friedell developed the groundbreaking science-based fair and impartial police training, which she and her fellow trainers administer across the United States and Canada. Beyond these significant accomplishments, Lori is also a trusted colleague of the IACP, serving as a member of our Research Advisory Committee and in lending her expertise to critical IACP policy initiatives. Most recently, she facilitated our 2014 National Policy Summit on Community Police Relations. So it was with a great deal of trust and confidence that I turn the reins over to her right now. Please welcome our forum moderator, Dr. Lori Friedell. Thank you. Uh, very good. Thank you, Chief Berry, for making me a part of this innovative break with IACP tradition. It's been a very difficult year for law enforcement, as evidenced by national poll numbers indicating that satisfaction with the police is at its lowest levels since the wake of the Rodney King incident. So it's very appropriate to bring out varied voices to speak with us today about the challenges facing the profession, particularly as they relate to police and the community. Please allow me to bring out today's distinguished panelists. Our first panelist is Cornell Brooks, President and Chief Executive Officer of the NAACP. 
Mr. Brooks took office in 2014 as the 18th person to serve in this role. He considers himself a grandson, heir, and beneficiary of the landmark decision Brown v. Board of Education, argued by legendary litigator Thurgood Marshall. In his role, he is working to build an NAACP that is multiracial, multiethnic, multigenerational, and one million members strong. Please welcome President of the NAACP, Cornell Brooks. Our second panelist is Chief of Police of the Arlington, Texas Police Department, Will Johnson. Chief Johnson was promoted through the ranks over a 19-year career to become the Arlington Police Department's 15th police chief. He is a Police Executive Research Forum Executive Fellow and published author. During his fellowship, he developed a use of force accountability model which focused on bridging informational silos within departments to create a culture of integrity. Chief Johnson holds a master's degree from Texas Christian University in liberal arts and a bachelor of arts from Texas Tech University. He is the current chair of the IACP Civil Rights Committee. Please welcome Chief Will Johnson. Our third panelist is Chief of Police of the Seattle Washington Police Department, Kathleen O'Toole. Chief O'Toole is a career police officer and lawyer who has broken ground on many fronts and earned an international reputation for her principled leadership and reform strategies. In 2004, Chief O'Toole was appointed police commissioner of Boston, Massachusetts, the first woman to hold this position. In 2012, she completed a six-year term as chief inspector of the Garda Shiakana Inspectorate, an oversight body responsible for bringing reform, best practice, and accountability to the 17,000-member Irish National Police Service. In 2014, she was nominated by Mayor Ed Murray to become Seattle's Chief of Police. Please welcome Chief Kathleen O'Toole. Our fourth panelist is Vanita Gupta, Acting Assistant Attorney General, Office of Civil Rights, U.S. Department of Justice. Vanita Gupta currently serves as head of the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. Under Ms. Gupta's leadership, the division continues its crucially important work in a number of areas, including advancing constitutional policing and other criminal justice reforms, promoting disability rights, protecting the rights of LGBTI individuals, and combating discrimination in education, housing, lending, and voting. Benita's leadership of the division has been notable because she has reached out early and often to law enforcement, understanding the importance of candid engagement and trust in these more challenging times. Prior to joining DOJ, she worked for the American Civil Liberties Union and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She is a graduate of Yale University, and her law degree is from the New York University School of Law. Please welcome Acting Assistant Attorney General Vanita Gupta. Thank you, panelists, for participating in this very important discussion. The panelists have seen the question that I have developed, and we talked about who was going to answer which questions. Everyone will answer the first question that I pose, and then two or three panelists will answer each of the following questions. I've asked the panelists to keep their responses to two minutes. The first question that I would like all of you to answer, and I'll be turning first to Ms. Gupta, Following the events in Ferguson, Missouri, President Obama implemented a task force on 21st century policing. What one or two recommendations in the task force report do you think are the most important and why are they most important? Ms. Gupta. 
Sure, thank you. Um, first, let me just say it's a real honor to be here this morning. And I want to convey from the Attorney General her deep disappointment and in her inability to be here this morning. She was very much looking forward to it. And she's been sick all week and was just unable to make the trip. So she sends her, her regards. Um, to me, the, uh, the task force report was incredibly important. It was really kind of a tipping point in some ways for the country on uh, the conversation we've been having over the last year on policing. But I selected out one particular provision, um, 4.2 that community policing has to be infused not only throughout the culture, uh, but also the organizational structure of law enforcement. That it is more, as my colleague Ron Davis likes to say, and as chiefs like Scott Thompson and Chris Magnus who are quoted in that section say, it's more than a 40-hour training. It's more than a particular tactic or unit that's set up in a police department. Uh, to me, actually, all of the other recommendations that are in the report give real detail, real concrete meaning to this particular provision. Um, I think that there is a real uh, need right now to emphasize just how important the role of the community is in being co-creators for public safety, that this cannot fall only on law enforcement, but that will only happen where there is meaningful trust and cooperation between the community and law enforcement. And I think that there are different jurisdictions that have taken very different ways of trying to achieve that. Seattle, Cleveland, there are jurisdictions where they've established community police commissions where representatives of law enforcement and the police union and uh, cross-section of community leaders uh, speak about policies and training and public safety priorities and that there's a structured way to keep that kind of conversation going. So I would say that that would be one that really stands out that to me infused, is infused throughout the rest of the report. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. Sure. Um, first of all, let me say on behalf of the 2,100 branches of the NAACP across the country uh, whose membership includes law enforcement. Uh, some of whom are here. Uh, we want to say thank you and thank you for the, your service and dedication. Uh, when you look through the report, uh, one of the uh, recommendations uh, is essential, that being a model of modality of policing that is based upon uh, protection as opposed to uh, a more warrior mode. We believe that, that that's critically uh, important because all across the country we see communities that regard themselves as objects of suspicion rather than subjects of protection. When that mindset and model suffuses the culture of police departments, law enforcement agencies, it translates into policy and in ways that engage the community. So when we look at the NAACP in say, for example, uh, New Jersey, where they are working, the state conference is working with uh, state police uh, in training. So it's not merely getting together to discuss policing, not merely getting together to discuss the aftermath of a tragedy, but getting together to fundamentally discuss uh, that which uh, inspires and moves this very body. That is to say, improving the art and science of policing. We believe that that's critical. Uh, related to that, I, I believe it's important to measure uh, on an annual basis, uh, community trust. Uh, it is, uh, if you will, uh, the ComSat of community building and community engaging. So to have a baseline of, of trust that you operate from, build upon, and police uh, is incredible. I should say incredibly important, and so much so that it should be a data point uh, in your work. Very good. Chief O'Toole. Well, first of all, I agree with Benita, uh, but since she already cited that recommendation, I'll go with two others. Okay. Um, first of all, the uh, community-based initiatives that address uh, the core issues of poverty, education, health, and safety uh, in our communities. We hope that the president will continue to support those programs. Uh, in Seattle, for instance, we have a, a homeless population that's growing very rapidly, and we're developing programs uh, to deal effectively with people in crisis. But the people, the, the police can't deal with these issues, face these issues alone. Alone, we need to work collaboratively uh, with other uh, disciplines um, and other agencies in order to address these issues effectively. So we're hoping that the president will continue to support that type of program. Um, also, uh, I learned this lesson a long time, uh, both in Boston on, and on the opposite side of the Atlantic. We must have police services that reflect the communities we serve. Um, in order for, for us to, to earn and maintain community trust and credibility, our police services must be reflective of our communities. So it's very important that we work hard to recruit um, the right people 
um, and a diverse group of people, and, and also um, officers and non-sworn personnel who understand that policing isn't just a job. If done right, it's truly a vocation. Very good. Chief Johnson. Thank you. You know, President Brooks said the art and science of policing. And I think that that is really critical when we look at the 21st Century Policing Report because I think that our experience is we have become very good at the science of policing. But we need to reground ourselves with the art of policing as it relates to relationships. Relationships are the foundation by which public trust is built and legitimacy in the community is maintained. So I think the building public trust and legitimacy pillar within the report is really the most important thing that we can do. And as we, as we express our core values of procedural justice and fairness and addressing disproportionality, I think that we can elevate the relationships within the police and the community and work towards the shared goals that we have. To be able to do that though, we've got to have an informed conversation. And so I think that uh, the improvement of technology, particularly as it relates to data collection for police use of force, is key. Right now, there are two different perspectives. One that force is, is used inappropriately at a great extent throughout the communities, and one that it is not used inappropriately at a great extent. And the numbers that back that up, depending on who's having that conversation, can shift radically. We must address that as a profession to have good reporting so that we can have an informed conversation about this topic. Very good. Thank you. Some have criticized the task force report and President Obama for trying to federalize law enforcement. Is this criticism valid? Should we fear the federalization of law enforcement? And I'm going to start with Ms. Gupta. Of course. <laughs> um, so, you know, I get asked this question in a lot of different venues, and the thing, the bottom line is, of course, that policing is a local function. And, um, you know, the president, when he announced the task force, didn't amass a set of federal officials in one room to come up with all the recommendations for state and local law enforcement. Uh, there were actually, I think, 150 witnesses who testified from the field, stakeholders uh, from local communities that are deeply invested in trying to think through these very challenging issues, oh, more than another 200 that submitted testimony. I mean, these are recommendations and guidances that are based on people in the field and people who have a stake in public safety in their communities and in community police trust. And that is out of which kind of the, the, the sentiment out of, uh, out of which the task force report really emanated. There's also, of course, at the Department of Justice, a whole host of resources through grants, technical assistance, through sometimes uh, the FBI helping local investigations where it's been requested and the like. Um, and that is the kind of support that is offered to state and local law enforcement. Uh, it's not an effort to federalize it. It is really an effort to support uh, state and local law enforcement in the field. At the Civil Rights Division, of course, we, out of you know, the relatively smaller number of pattern and practice investigations that we've had, um, we know there's no cookie cutter, no formula, no federal model for how to do this. We go into every community and spend a lot of time engaging with line officers, police union leaders, uh, command staff, community leaders, civil rights leaders, civic leaders, business leaders, um, to really understand what the problems are, uh, uh, what kind of issues are being presented in police community relations locally. And then I think really importantly in the remedy part. Um, we can't impose remedies from the top down from Washington, D.C. Those remedies are infused by the input of people in the police department, of the police chiefs, of, again, all of the people that I just, that I just mentioned. Because ultimately, uh, you know, the Department of Justice doesn't want to be there a day longer than we need to. Mm -hmm. We want to get out and we want to have sustained reform. And in order to have sustained, long-lasting, meaningful reform, uh, the remedies need to have buy-in locally and need to be driven by the local expertise that is represented in this room and in communities all over the country. And so uh, I think that's a really important um, piece of the work that, that, that I think we are doing. And, uh, and frankly, the richest conversations on these issues are actually happening in local communities right now. Uh, that's where that stuff really comes to have a lot of meaning for folks. Very good. Thank you. Chief O'Toole. Well, I'd be disappointed if the federal government didn't take a significant interest in policing. I think it's a responsibility. Uh, I've been in this business for more than three decades, and the federal government has taken an interest on several occasions. And I think in each instance, we have evolved, we've improved. Uh, so I welcome the task force report, and I think every chief should consider the recommendations carefully. 
Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that every recommendation will apply to every community in this country, but I think it's important to look at them, consider them in the context of, uh, of, of each community, culture-proof them to determine if they'll fit in, in each community, and uh, use it as a roadmap. Uh, in Seattle, we're also under a federal consent decree. And I think initially there was some resistance, there was some frustration, uh, but in the long run, it's really provided us with a great blueprint uh, for reform. And uh, it's, it's working well now because we're approaching it collaboratively. We're working very closely with the monitoring team, with the Department of Justice, and with our community partners uh, to ensure that we not only uh, live up to all the requirements in the consent decree, and, and, uh, but not just tick the boxes, that we realize the true spirit of the consent decree. Okay. Mr. Brooks. Sure. So when we say uh, federalize as, uh, as a form of critique or criticism, I think it's important to note uh, that in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, uh, we had the Department of Justice with its pattern and practice investigation and report uh, derived uh, from evidence, evidence derived from statistics, statistics mandated by state law that the NAACP uh, wrote with the governor when he was attorney general. Uh, this was a state law. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, this body uh, believes in, uh, for, uh, for decades on end, a professionalism, a, a standard of excellence. And so where we have communities that expect that same standard of excellence, who look, at their, look to their police departments and law enforcement agencies with a sense of expectation, it is not wrong to expect that standard to be universal, um, to cover uh, the country. And so uh, we believe that that relates to data, the availability of data, uh, data being universal and having universal uh, standards of accountability. And that necessarily involves the federal government. Thank you. Many of the recommendations in the task force report reflect recommendations made by many commissions on law enforcement over the last half a century. Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Why will these recommendations work now? Mr. Brooks, I turn right back to you. While it is true that many of the recommendations have been echoed in reports all across the country, what is particularly distinctive about this moment is the fierce urgency of now. The fact is that we can look in our newspapers, watch our televisions, scan our mobile devices, and we literally have a generation of young people who believe that they are in the midst of a generational assault. Uh, they believe, as based, based upon their lived experience, um, what they read in the newspaper, what they see, that this is a crisis. It's a crisis uh, and a gulf of distrust between law enforcement and the community. I believe that we're here, that we've, we've gathered ourselves in this place at this time. We're having this important conversation because we collectively believe that we have to respond to this moment. And if that is in fact the case, this moment is different and we can do policing differently, and we can engage police departments differently uh, because we have the collective will. If we blink this moment, we blink a historic opportunity to see both a precipitous drop in crime and a, um, a dramatic rise in community trust based upon a fundamental change in the way in which the community is treated and respected and protected. Thank you. Chief O'Toole. I think we're revisiting the important principles of policing, but it's time to push the reset button. Communities across this country are demanding reform, police reform, and we need to respond to that. Unless we have the support of our communities, we'll fail. Uh, so I think it's an important time to embrace this opportunity um, and to work collaboratively to, uh, to address it. Thank you. Much of the cloud over law enforcement over the last 14 months is linked to community concerns about the police use of force. What changes, if any, in police use of force need to be made, and do we need national measures? I'm starting with you, Chief Johnson. Well, I think that the conversation related to the police use of force is always the first place that we should look because it, it represents 
the state using its power to, to influence its coercive will on the public to achieve a goal, a lawful goal. But before we can have that conversation, we have, we have to acknowledge that the overwhelming majority of contacts that we have with the community, no force is used at all. And in, within the subset where force is used, overwhelmingly it's an appropriate level of force. And then the final thing that's, that's really important on this topic is the use of force by police, constitutionally valid force, is still violent and should be upsetting to people when they see it. And so police departments have to actively engage their community to share about why police are trained in certain ways and how force is applied in a lawful manner so that the community can under, better understand signs whenever it is being applied in an unlawful manner. We've got to be able to continue our de-escalation and try to, to circumvent the opportunity for force to be used. And I think this piece is critical too. We have to also acknowledge when we see an inappropriate application of force for what it is and respond accordingly. But the data point represents the greatest risk. We do not have a systematic way to report use of force encounters within the United States. And in Texas this last year, we extended uh, a new law where every use of force that results in a serious body injury or death of a citizen has to be reported. And every assault on a police officer that results in serious bodily injury or death has to be reported. That's not going to solve all the problems, but it's a step in the right direction, and I hope other states follow. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. I think it's important to uh, note here that all across the country, there's apprehension about uh, the ubiquity of cell phone technology and the fact that we have these viral videos. Um, that's certainly a point of concern in terms of the perception and reality uh, in terms of excessive use of force. But it is also important to note that we have a need for national standard for excessive use of force. Uh, it's important for us to realize the need for the um, In Racial Profiling Act. It's important for us to also appreciate the fact that the public has a right to expect accountability and transparency and procedural justice, which means independent prosecutors. We can't be apprehensive about viral videos and not be equally concerned about ensuring that there's a standard that can be relied upon, that can be measured, that you can collect data upon, and that you can hold that minority of officers who cross the line accountable. Where we have members of the NAACP and people from all walks of life who see school children brutalized in their classrooms or at a pool party. We can respond to that um, with talk around the water cooler, or we can collect data, create standards, and get the job done and fulfill the, mi the mission of this organization, uh, that is to say, improving the science and the art of policing. Thank you. Ms. Gupta. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just to piggyback on what Cornell was saying, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think there is, I mean, the crux of a lot of the conversations right now that are happening around the country have been propelled by some of the kind of viral videos and the like. And last night there was another one out of South Carolina. And, you know, there is, um, I think, a really robust conversation that's happening right now. Outside of even, I think, what the law says, what kind of norms do we want as a community and a society on these issues? Um, you know, Perf had a really good convening earlier this year on re-engineering police use of force and looking at the re-engineering the training on police use of force that I think really asked some of the harder questions about outside of the four corners of the law. What are we, what do, what do communities expect? What is going to keep officers safe and the public safe? I think that, you know, I will just use um, Chief O'Toole's leadership in Seattle. I think Seattle is really changing the paradigm on, on use of force right now, both in terms of, you know, recently, I think it was maybe in January, I'm not, not sure, but all of their officers got retrained in this very extensive de-escalation training, which is really not just about kind of reading body language and communication skills and the like, but actually beyond kind of what are the tactical approaches, but what is the, you know, how, what kind of community policing, what does community policing in Seattle look like when it's engaging in de-escalation de and de-escalation is a core principle of that. Um, I also think in Seattle, and the chief alluded to this, 
you know, there, we found when we did our investigation in Seattle that a very significant percentage of the incidences of excessive use of force were happening uh, with people in interactions with people in crisis or the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And Seattle has done, I think, really what is paradigm shifting around bringing in folks from the mental health community, from mental social services, the medical community, and the like, literally, who are becoming part of, with the Seattle Police Department, first responders in these instances. And we just was out there with the Attorney General and the Chief just a month ago, uh, and we got our first set of data that showed a dramatic reduction in the use of force in these encounters. And it's keeping officers safer, it's keeping the public safer, it's changing attitudes towards uh, the community, between the community and law enforcement. And so I think that's a key thing. I want to also close on what is, I think, a critical part of this that a number that I think all the panelists have alluded to, which is there is no question that we need national consistent data on use of force. You know, it's, tw it's 2015, um, and we need to do better. Uh, I think the, the, the law enforcement profession deserves to have that information. The community deserves to have that information. And I think that really it's, it's time for us to be able to have national consistent data. It's going to allow for agencies to identify issues and self-correct. And it's also going to be revealing, I think, for communities about what's real and what's not. And I think it's time for us to really put a keen focus on that issue. Very good. Chief O'Toole. Well, because this is such an important issue, I'd like to weigh in, too. Um, Vinita mentioned we're making a very significant investment in, um, in the, the use of force policy and uh, training, and we're involving the community as well as our police unions in that process. As we developed our new use of force policy, everybody had a voice at the table. And then after the six-month review, everybody again had a voice at the table, and we were able to make some, uh, some adjustments. So I think that um, use of force is such an important issue, and mostly we're investing in de-escalation training. Uh, we now have police departments from all over the country coming to look at the de-escalation training. Uh, of course, we've been under the consent decree for a few years now, so we just had a little uh, jump start on our reform process. Um, and if we can share some of that knowledge with others, we don't cl claim to have all of the answers, but the de-escalation training is, is, has been very effective and the officers really appreciate it. Mm. We can't lose sight of the fact that we need to provide our officers with the guidance through policy, but also with the training that's required um, in order to do their jobs effectively. And I think now they're enthusiastic because they're seeing the results of it. Uh, we're on, we're on uh, track to do 10,000 crisis interventions, significant interventions this year. And, and as mentioned, often those crisis interventions result in some form of force. We're showing a dramatic de decrease in the number of force incidents uh, because of our new trainings uh, and, and policies. Very good. Thank you. When I train around the country, I'm frequently reminded how demoralized officers are right now. One cop told me, I joined this profession to be the good guy. <clears throat> And right now, I'm seen as the bad guy. What are police leaders doing? What should they be doing to support the troops during this time of relatively low regard for the police profession? And Chief Johnson, I'll start with you. I think the first thing that we've got to do is acknowledge that that feeling exists. So officers are impacted in their, their mental health whenever they perceive some of the videos that are directly attacking police or on some of the assassinations of officers while they were serving. Those have profound impact in our profession. We have to acknowledge that. There can be a greater debate about whether or not there's a de-policing taking place, but there is a mental health uh, awareness that has to take place as police leaders as we try to lead and speak to our officers. So I was really grateful that the task force members acknowledged that as a pillar of one of the findings that we need to focus on the, the mental health of officers, their wellness and their safety as we work through these challenging times. Because we do know this fundamental fact, no community wants to be void of police. Every community wants to be safe and secure and the police need to be a part of that conversation. But I also want to uh, make this point too. We started an academy class in Arlington, Texas, two weeks after Ferguson. And that room was filled full of young um, and very energetic and excited people that were just beginning their policing career. I walked into that room with a little bit of tre trepidation, like, are you sure that you want to do this? The feeling was overwhelming. We know that it's difficult. We know that the, it's very challenging. 
but we want to make a difference in our community. We want to make a difference with how people see the police, and we're up to the task. And I would tell you that the American police officer is doing just that in neighborhoods right now. Thank you. Ms. Gupta? Um, you know, I agree. I think it needs to start with an acknowledgement that these are really challenging times um, for law enforcement, and I think, and for communities that are really struggling to understand um, what kind of policing they want and deserve in their communities. And I think that for police officers, I would hope that a police leader hearing that would say, you are the good guy. You entered into this profession to perform public service and that these conversations right now that are happening and, and you know, some of it gets ugly sometimes and some of it is incredibly constructive, but it is, you know, the, 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 the prospect of the conflict that comes around building trust and the importance of the moment right now to, to really get to have these real conversations in a meaningful way, I think, um, are, are good things and need to be embraced as difficult as some of the kind of ugliness of on the outside is. We don't want to accept uh, we want nonviolent, constructive conversation around around these challenges. I also think that there's a real, uh, and I think the task force report got it right in focusing on officer safety and wellness. I think that officer safety and wellness has to be a key component of uh, constitutional and community policing. I think, frankly, we ask more than one can reasonably expect out of our police officers. We have thrown mental illness, school discipline, you know, substance abuse, drug abuse, all kinds of social problems at the feet of law enforcement and at the feet of our criminal justice system. It doesn't have to be that way, but we have done that here. And I think right now, And look, you know, the policing conversation that we're having right now in this country is happening against the backdrop of a much bigger conversation about what we have done in our criminal justice system for, for these many decades. And I think that we have to recognize the burdens that we have placed on law enforcement and think of other paradigms, but also provide them with the support, the training, the counseling, the, I mean, the incredible stress that they deal with every day on the job has to be a part of this conversation. And so, you know, I, to me, I think what is gratifying at least is that the year that we have had is also happening against a backdrop of a much bigger conversation. But I think in recognition of what all we have placed at the feet of law enforcement, I think, needs to be recognized and acknowledged even as we try to have some of these tough conversations about where we go as a country on criminal justice. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. One thing I just wanted to, to lift up here is that with the uh, support of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, the NAACP uh, did a march from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C., 1,002 miles. We worked with uh, small police departments, departments, uh, sheriffs, uh, state bureaus of investigation. One of the things that I noted was that spending 46 days with police officers who were responsible for our safety, with a great, amidst a great number of people who were not particularly happy uh, with the NAACP doing its traditional work. And we marched under the banner, Our Lives Matter making the point that we want to see a fundamental reform in policing, having tough conversations about racial profiling, about excessive use of force, but in the context of relationship. Mm -hmm. Those were important discussions, important relationships, but I believe they were also an affirmation of the vocation of policing. That's important. If we come to the conversation assuming that we want many of the same things. The reason I'm on this panel is because Chief Barry and I sat next to one another, had a conversation about the tough critique of the NAACP and the tough challenges that you all face. When we realized that the critique and the challenges exist side by side for the betterment of the community and the betterment of policing, we go well along the way to getting to where we all want to be. And in so doing, I believe it affirms supports the vocation of policing. Very good. Thank you. The task force report consistently talks about perceptions of the police, how we need to improve perceptions of the police. How much of the reform that needs to occur in policing is actually about changing the police, and how much is about merely changing the perceptions of police? Chief O'Toole. 
Well, we'd be fooling ourselves if we said we had a perception problem only. Um, obviously, there's always room for significant improvement in our organizations. So um, I think we have to deal with the reality. And in Seattle, we're dealing with that reality right now. And we have our roadmap for reform. But I also think we do a terrible job of telling our own story um, and telling our story on behalf of our officers. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure our community knows what we do from day to day. Um, they watch television and they see news reports and they think policing is all about uh, gunfights and car chases. And they don't realize the amount of effort we're putting into uh, providing services to people in crisis or people who are homeless or people who are facing poverty. So um, I think we need to tell our stories better as, pl as uh, police chiefs. Uh, we're trying to um, also communicate more effectively with the next generation of leaders um, who aren't necessarily taking their messages from traditional leaders. Uh, so we engage in lots of social media. We have 135,000 Twitter followers now. Uh, we also are uh, developing community policing micro plans for each neighborhood and aligning them with the next door application, which is a Facebook for neighborhoods. So I think it's really important as police chiefs that we get out there um, and, and inform our communities and, and educate them as to what policing is all about and engage to the greatest extent possible. Okay, thank you. Ms. Gupta. Well, I, um, you know, I think perceptions and change are kind of interrelated. It's hard to know chicken and egg kind of thing with there. And I think really the trust and legitimacy that can come through some of the change pieces, and I think that's where the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing has roadmaps. The consent decrees out of the Civil Rights Division provide roadmaps. There are incredible innovation happening in police departments um, around the country through various programs and the like. Those help to change perceptions. You know, law enforcement has to be more than responding to calls for service. And the ability of, it goes back to the relationships piece of this, that it's a lot harder to demonize. And I would say this is as equal for the community as it is for law enforcement, but a lot harder to demonize and create a certain impression of the other, the us versus them, um, when you actually are engaged in looking at each other, you know, in the face, having conversations, having tough conversations, but actually, I mean, it sounds trite, but it seems to be pretty true that, that is how perceptions change. And you know, I was out in Oakland with the um, former Attorney General when he was doing his community um, trust tour. And in Oakland, they had a cadet training where the cadets actually spent time in a boys and girls club as part of their training. And the kids there had a very different impression and very real kind of impression of the cadets and the police in their community because they were seeing them constantly in a non-enforcement context, playing basketball, mentoring, tutoring. Um, you know, there are so many innovative programs around the country that, that uh, I think really deserve to be lifted up that I think are key and fundamental to changing perceptions even as communities start to really look at ways to maybe do some of the policy change and engage in some innovative training so that short of a critical incident there is a reservoir of trust that exists um, where, you know, the, the assumptions that can really sometimes be detrimental in the aftermath of those don't, you know, don't have to come into being and actually there is, you know, there's trust there between law enforcement and the community. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. When we talk about the ratio between perception and reality, I think for a generation of particularly young people, um, the reality is pretty brutal and pretty hard. So when a young black man is 21 times more likely to lose his life at the hands of the police than his white counterpart, where we see Walter Scott executed on tape, when we uh, see Tamir Rice uh, lose his life within seconds. That's a brutal reality for many of our children and their parents and their grandparents. It is also a reality that for members of this association who are African American and Latino, who have been mistreated by the police and have their own stories. I don't know of any black man of a certain age who doesn't have such a story. Those are, those are real challenges. And so this is not a perception problem. It's not a cosmetic public relations problem. And to the extent that misperceptions, apprehension, mistrust make prosecutions more difficult, make it more difficult to secure witnesses, and make policing harder, perception is reality. So we all have our work to do. The NAACP has its work to do. 
Uh, all of you have your work to do, but we all have a common shared work to do together to address both perception and reality. But we can't understate this. This is a crisis, and it's a crisis that literally our children, children are holding us accountable for and addressing it with a sense of now, with a fierce urgency. We can't wait until, uh, until the perception goes away or somehow diminishes. Thank you. At last year's IACP Community Police Summit, there was much talk about a new paradigm for policing, a new paradigm to remedy the negative police community relations. The ACLU representative countered that we don't need a new paradigm for policing. We just need the police to treat the less powerful the same way they treat the powerful. Is she right or wrong, Mr. Brooks? That may be um, a part of it, uh, in the sense that when you look at the policies of stop and frisk in New York City, it would be hard to imagine those policies carried out in communities that were not communities of color, uh, communities that were not economically challenged. It would be very, very difficult to imagine those policies. So it is a matter of a power dynamic. But we also understand, and particularly uh, this association understands, it has everything to do with the model of policing. It has everything to do with our technology. It has everything to do with the modality of our policing. So we don't want to to uh, understate the case or oversimplify the case. But it has a lot to do with the humanity and the decency with which we treat people. Uh, it's, it's not a merely a matter of having a certain income. We have to ask ourselves, would we, any of us feel comfortable having our child thrown across a classroom? Uh, how many of us feel comfortable with the fact that we have so, many law, so much of law enforcement in classroom trying to do what it is that public school teachers are charged with doing? How many of us are comfortable with the, the notion uh, that uh, you can be patted down, have someone put, it, put their hands on you simply because of how you look, uh, the color of your skin, the, your degree of pigmentation? And so we don't want to understate the case. We don't want to oversimplify the case. It's not simply a matter of income or the degree of power that you have, but it has much to do with that. Okay, good. Chief Johnson. Well, I think that the, the point of oversimplification is, is key here. So uh, if it's oversimplifying an entire conversation. So if you ask me, do I agree with her comments about the police should provide equal protection under the law? Well, then absolutely I'm in agreement with that. If, you, if you're asking me if I don't believe that police are providing compassion and proper police services to the poorest of poor who have no voice, I, I completely disregard that because the police are actively working to serve their communities. And if we take it back to the previous question about perception, I think we have a transference problem here. See, what happens in one community gets transferred to another community that may not be doing those same policing practices. And so they suddenly own the actions of others because they wear the same badge. And I think we have to address that issue, and that is absolutely a perception issue. But if we get back to the point, if we get to the point, are we in a new paradigm of policing? I think that we actually are. I think that we are entering into a new era of policing, one that has not yet been defined, but one that the research is telling us that historically we have been producing what we thought were the best performance metrics that the community wanted, arrest to reduce crime. But we know from Tom Tyler's research on why people obey the law that as the crime rate has fallen historically over the last 30 years, the public perception of the police has remained relatively flat. So that tells me that we are doing things that, that we think hold great value that the community is kind of agnostic on. It's, it's neither good nor bad. So this new era of policing is trying to get the police scorecard in line with what the community expectations are so that we can produce the, the outcomes that the community is looking for. Ms. Gupta. Yeah, I actually do think that statement is a little bit oversimplifying, um, and I agree with the previous speakers, but I, I think that we are in a time where we should be shifting the paradigm uh, in response to what all has happened over the last year, but also in the lessons that we've learned over the last several years. And I think the warrior to guardian 
kind of move in through you know the work that's articulated in the 21st Century Policing Task Force, the community policing. That is a paradigm shift. It is not, as I said, a program that you in, you know bring into a police department for 40 hours. It is changing, and and there are police departments that have been doing this for a long time. But I think that it will be a mistake for us to sit back and just say this is just about perceptions or this is just about uh, you know, needing everyone to be treated the way that the wealthy are. This really is a chance for us to have a serious conversation as a country in our communities all over the country about what is the paradigm of policing? What, what, are, what really is the way in which community police um, uh, interactions should take place? And that to do anything else would actually be a gross missed opportunity for us uh, in this country right now. Thank you. This past year, there's been a significant increase in state prosecutions of police for officer-involved shootings. And it seems an increased number of officers fired for excessive force or other transgressions. How do you explain this increase? Are we sacrificing our officers as we seek enhanced trust and confidence? Are these increases evidence of increased accountability or something else? Ms. Gupta. So, you know, I would, I don't know what all of the data is behind these, um, behind the, the market increase. And I think that it's hard to make any generalized statements when I don't know whether there was video footage in all of the cases that resulted in indictments. I don't know what the factors are. And these are very individualized decisions. These are decisions that are being made either by police chiefs or district attorneys around the country uh, with very, you know, fact-specific, fact-laden um, inquiries. And, uh, and so, to me, it's really hard to make any kind of generalized statement right now. Is there greater attention being paid around the country to these issues? Yes. But do we know whether that is motivating this? I don't know. I also think that, you know, the key thing is that officers, when charged, like all defendants, deserve due process, uh, need to have due process, and that uh, if the facts and law don't bear themselves out with these charges, well, then the outcomes will be what they will be. And the, the um, and, and so I, you know, and my guess is that for police leaders in this room, that if they have an officer who was charged and convicted, the response would not be, well, we've sacrificed that officer to a greater principle. The response, my guess, would be that officer shouldn't be on the force. It's not good for um, for the police department, and it's not good for the community. And so I'm <coughs> wary of drawing over generalizations about this, not knowing the specifics, because I think there's a lot of individual decision makers around the country that are that are playing into, uh, uh, that are making these decisions. Okay, Chief Johnson. I, I would agree totally. I mean, it's very difficult to come up with, uh, with pinpointing an answer about what is the cause whenever we have such a lack of information as to the data that's driving the question. So it really feeds back into the conversation about we need a national use of force database that helps us understand what are the trends and issues because from, as a police leader, as we, as we look at what the trend is, once it becomes an individual criminal case, then trend information is no longer relevant. The due process rights of that individual and the specific articulable facts for that case is really the only facts of merit at that point in time. And so I don't think, that it's, I don't think it's entirely productive for the field to focus on the individual case. I think it's necessary for us to pull back and see what are the drivers and what can we do in the systems in which we influence training, hiring, uh, uh, cultural aspects of the organization to reduce these from happening in the first place. Can we have aggressive crime fighting and still produce public trust and confidence in those same communities? And if yes, what's the trick, Chief O'Toole? Well, rather than referring to it as aggressive crime fighting, I'd rather um, use the adjective effective uh, crime fighting. And I do not think that effective crime fighting and constitutional policing are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've, we've seen recently that it can be accomplished if we work hard at it. I'll just use an example. Um, we recently were getting lots of complaints from community in downtown Seattle about open air drug dealing. Mm -hmm. And we did an undercover operation and determined that we had nearly 175 drug dealers operating on one block. So obviously we needed to do something about it. 
But we did, we did it very thoughtfully. We worked with our lead program. We worked with our drug courts. Uh, we worked with, uh, in a multidisciplinary approach. And we looked at each one of those suspects to determine you know, which ones were people who were, had substance abuse issues, who needed help. Uh, that, that were supporting their own habits, that could go to diversion programs. Uh, and on the other extreme, which ones were the gun-toting drug dealers who were uh, holding everybody hostage in that particular neighborhood? So I think we just need to apply very thoughtful approaches. I know it doesn't work, you know, going into poor neighborhoods with these high-profile enforcement initiatives because we've all determined that even in the most difficult, challenging neighborhoods, crime neighborhoods, the vast majority of people are good, decent people who are law-abiding and need our help. So I just think we need to be very thoughtful about our law enforcement um, approaches. Chief Johnson. I think we absolutely can. You know, if we go back to, to some of the previous comments uh, about uh, the lack of capacity in our mental illness uh, sector of our communities, substance abuse, uh, education, job placements, all of the things that drive uh, how, what the health of a community is, we've defunded those, we, we haven't given the appropriate amount of emphasis on those, and we've deferred to the police to handle all those problems. And now we're having a conversation that we're angry at the police by the manner in which they're addressing those things whenever we didn't address the underlying core issues. So if we address those core issues, we will not have to use the police to solve all those problems, which means our incarceration rates will go down. So last week, over 130 police chiefs, district attorneys, and leaders in the law enforcement profession uh, were with the law enforcement leaders to reduce mass incarceration and crime. We absolutely believe that we can, we can uh, address crime, violent crime offenders, send those individuals to the penitentiary and reduce mass incarceration by elevating these other social structures that are out there. Thank you. Can I, and I just want to add a good push on one thing, which is I think that also, um, I'm going to push just a little bit, which is that we also have to be clear, and this is I think community to community, about what public safety means in the community. Because, you know, with our, the investigation that we did in Ferguson where we found that policing was really uh, being used to generate revenue through tickets uh, and, and fines as opposed to for what I think most police officers would have signed up to do uh, as part of their job, that this is, you know, in some, uh, in some rooms that was considered policing for public safety, but in many others, including in many law enforcement rooms, um, that was not policing for public safety. That was policing for a different reason to fill kind of local coffers that had severe consequences on uh, the relationship between law enforcement and the community in that jurisdiction. It's not unique to Ferguson. It, it exists in other parts of the country. But I also think that we need to be pushing, even as we are pushing, on what alternative systems need to be stepping in a little bit more to address some of the problems that we've placed at the feet of law enforcement. Also to be very clear about what kind of, what does public safety really look like in a community? And that's where having community input into law enforcement priorities is critically important. Did you want to come? Sure. Um, I just really wanted to underscore that point. Um, in Ferguson, I first heard about the municipal fine problem, uh, not from police officers, not from anyone in City Hall, but among teenagers. Mm -hmm. And they made the connection between essentially predatory policing based upon predatory taxation and an inappropriate use of law enforcement and a delegitimizing use of law enforcement. And to go to the scholarship of Tracy Mears to the extent that the legitimacy of law enforcement has everything to do with encouraging law-abiding behavior, we have to focus on what can we do to support legitimate uses of law enforcement, uh, diverse use of law enforcement tools, so the, the use of uh, problem-solving courts, uh, community courts, youth courts, all those things are important. Also understanding policing in the context of a, a broader strategy of uh, criminal justice in terms of the, the era, and I'm going to use the words here, uh, the era of mass incarceration. Uh, the fact of the matter is policing is not done in a vacuum. Legitimacy is not derived in a vacuum. And to the extent that the community is engaged 
with all of those tools and with the appropriate use of law enforcement, we advance policing, we make communities safer, and we make communities in which police officers live safer. Good. Thank you. The key to police community relations is not the programs that the departments adopt, like Shop with a Cop or Community Police Academies. Good relations comes from each and every interaction on the street with an officer and a community member. What is the key, or what are the keys, for improving those interactions across the country? And what does the training look like? Chief O'Toole. Well, it's, I think we're at um, a very interesting time in terms of community policing. And I, I think the, the panel made the point earlier that community policing shouldn't be an assignment or a project or program. It should be the foundation on which everything is built. Um, and I think as chiefs, we need to lead by example. We need to get out there and engage to the greatest extent possible and set, set a, an example for our officers. But we also need to provide opportunities for them to engage as well. Uh, we've uh, initiated a project now where we have our police officers on the ground working with members of our community to develop a plan for each neighborhood in our city. Um, our city is a, a city of very unique, proud neighborhoods, and the precinct captains defined those neighborhoods, and now we're uh, turning to the community and to our police officers to develop, to develop a micro plan. So we're not dictating our community policing strategy from the top down. We're actually developing it grassroots from the bottom up. So it's cops on the beat and people living and working in our neighborhoods who are informing the strategy. That gives the officers an opportunity the, the beat officers out there an opportunity to engage with the community to a greater extent. And the more we get them to engage, uh, the more effective our policing will be. Very good. Ms. Gupta. Well, I think building trust is a critical part of effective law enforcement. It's really essential to public safety. And I think procedural justice, contacts uh, between the community and law enforcement outside of the enforcement context is really important. Enhanced training, all of these things make our communities uh, safer. You know, I, as, as sometimes trite as those programs sound, I actually think they provide structured opportunities for that kind of non-enforcement uh, uh, engagement in the relationship building. And I think that that stuff really does develop into real relationships in meaningful ways that, that I think can play dividends, pay dividends into building trust on the ground. Um, there are a lot of different effective trainings, and I think uh, the Office of Justice Programs under the direction of Assistant Attorney General Carol Mason has just one that comes to mind right now on tax, tactics and trust that really builds on the latest scientific evidence on what is effective at building uh, community trust and engagement. And I think, you know, it's, uh, there's, it's a science, it's an art, it's all of these things, but um, but it has to be done in a sustained way, and it can't be either in the immediate aftermath of a critical incident uh, if it hasn't been done before. It's a lot harder to make that happen immediately after. That's when the us versus them uh, can really quickly form. And so it has to be, there has to be a sustained commitment over time to do that kind of work, and I think there's a whole variety of ways that departments and communities are doing this. Thank you. Currently, African Americans' confidence in the police is at 30%, well below the national average of 53%, and much lower than for any other subgroup. African Americans have expressed this low confidence for decades, even as many police departments have tried to improve their relationship with African Americans in their communities. Have we made progress? Why or why not? Mr. Brooks. We've certainly made progress, but we have a, a great deal more progress to make. Uh, the uh, chronically low uh, regard and unsustainably, I should say, unforgivably low regard uh, is something that we can address. Um, one of the things that is, is key is diversifying the ranks. And what that means is if there's a meritocracy in the profession, a meritocracy in the vocation, it must mean opening up the pipeline so that the best qualified folks uh, come forward. And that means reaching communities um, that may be underrepresented uh, in the ranks. That's critically important. I think it's critically important to engage leadership in communities. When you talk to governors and mayors across the country, as I do on a uh, not infrequent uh, occasion, the ones that see their cities um, 
in the throes of crisis or go up in flames are generally the ones that do not have relationships with uh, leaders in the NAACP and other organizations. They don't have relationships with the black community. And so uh, their relationship building occurs in the context of crisis. Well, that's uh, pretty late in the day. And so to the extent that we understand that diversifying the ranks, engaging the African American community among other communities of color is not peripheral to, but central to the mission of policing, we are more effective in that effort. Now the community has a responsibility too here. We cannot regard the uh, police department, uh, uh, law enforcement, as a occupying army. Uh, we have to regard them as partners in public safety. That presumes a certain degree of, uh, of trust uh, and engagement um, that is driven by uh, real work, real, uh, or I should say, real work, real engagement, uh, data, uh, and real outcomes. Uh, it is not a public relations uh, exercise. But Again, I will emphasize that if there is a year for us to do this kind of work, to take it up seriously, to measure it, to be held accountable, uh, this is such a year. Chief Johnson. I think certainly there's been a, a tremendous amount of effort and improvement in this category, but the statistics clearly show there's much more work to be done. And so I'm really glad that you brought up recruiting because uh, recruiting is key to this whole conversation. If we know that there is, is a lower than average uh, uh, support for the police within the African American community, that also becomes a principal stumbling block for us to effectively recruit within the black community because how difficult is it for somebody to want to aspire to be the police when around the kitchen table, when in the, in the pews of houses of faith, people are always talking negatively about the police. We have got to have a conversation where we are m moving towards shared goals of diversification for the organizations so that we can improve the perception of the police within the black communities. And the police will not be able to do that without the support of the NAACP and other groups as we actively work to have those conversations in our community to provide access to people to be able to answer the questions that they want answered, to voice the concerns that they have voiced, and to be able to build the relationships because if there's not a relationship, then we know we're not going to be able to move the needle in terms of this topic. Okay. Ms. Gupta. I, I also think it's really important to acknowledge the history of this country and the history of how we got to here. And, you know, I, I don't think we should get stuck there, but to not acknowledge it and the role that law enforcement has played historically on enforcing some of the laws that were not of their creation necessarily, but uh, I think that is an important thing to acknowledge in the rooms that we're in when we're talking about these issues. I also think it's a complete mistake for us to talk about issues in policing and criminal justice uh, in racial tension in uh, the African American community in particular without actually also acknowledging that in a lot of the communities where we have seen unrest over the last year, there's also incredible inequality in access to housing, access to transportation, employment, where are the jobs, where's the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the access to adequate education. And so, again, this isn't just a policing problem. I think that right now, the opportunity that is afforded to us as a country as we struggle on these issues around policing are really tied to much bigger conversations mm. around uh, equality, inequality, access to fundamental things like education and employment and housing. Um, and I think that right now, again, for that reason, it presents a real opportunity. It's not to just diffuse everything, but I think that, again, it would be a lost opportunity for us to not acknowledge the importance of these other parts of uh, communities that have a role to play and a responsibility as well. Chief O'Toole? Yeah, I, I think that we really need to continue to work on the relationships with the traditional civil rights leaders and the faith-based leaders, but also put a significant focus on the next generation. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an investment we need to make at this point. We need to show these kids that we care. And I think that as police chiefs, people listen to us in our communities. And we're in a position where we can advocate for better educational programs, jobs programs, alternatives for kids. Uh, and both in Boston, Seattle, wherever I've been in the world, I really try to make that investment and encourage our officers to get out there and devote time to this too. Because when these young people know that we care about them and we're advocating for them, they're more likely to trust and, and uh, develop that trust that's so essential to effective policing. So now I'm turning away from the questions that I had prepared 
to questions that were tweeted to the IACP staff for this panel. The first one reads as follows. Transparency has become the battle cry around police reform. How do we balance that against protecting investigations, victims, and officers? And I'm starting with you, Chief O'Toole. Well, I work in a jurisdiction now in Seattle where we probably have the most liberal uh, public disclosure laws in the country. Uh, everything is transparent. I I'm inclined to be transparent anyway. We try to get as much information out there as soon as possible. Um, of course, there will be exceptions where we have to protect an investigation or protect a victim and we'll uh, explain why we're holding information back. But the days of duck and cover um, and dodging a crisis are over. I learned early in my career from my mentors that it's best to address a situation head on, tell the truth, stand up and take responsibility, and provide as much information as possible. Okay. Ms. Gupta. Ditto to what the chief said, I think. I, um, I, you know, I think there, there are obviously privacy concerns in individual investigations and uh, protecting witnesses and victims. but. Uh, I think that communities where there is greater, where there's more awareness about what the police department's practices and priorities are, um, go a long way. It goes a long way to demystifying the ways in which police departments work. And I think that this happens often, not just by what police departments put on their website and through social media, which I think is also important, but also I think um, through, you know, structured ways for the community to engage over a sustained period of time in groups with law enforcement, whether it's community police commissions, whether it's a whole other host of factors that, that provide for structures for the community and the police to actually talk about what kind of training, what kind of priorities and the like. And that's where I think you see enormous transparency yielding great dividends for building trust. Mr. Brooks. I, I would just like to note here the tension between um, account, I should say, transparency and uh, perceived independence. To the extent that investigations are perceived to be uh, independent, where there are moments where uh, a law enforcement agency can't be transparent, as in releasing information that the public would like to have, uh, there's a, a certain degree of patience, uh, a certain degree of trust. But where there's not a perception of independence, mm -hmm. then there's less patience for less information. Mm -hmm. That's important. And so to the extent that we need independent prosecutors, to the extent that we uh, have, for example, uh, a justice department that has been regarded as being independent, even in moments where information has not been forthcoming, there's generally been the sense that um, uh, we can trust what they're trying to do because they are trying to do that which the most they can do under the law. That's important to know. Mm -hmm. A body camera question. Put a body camera on every cop and all problems will be solved. Not likely, but what is the real value of this emerging technology, this person asks, and I'll start with you, Chief O'Toole. Well, again, I think that um, it promotes transparency. And uh, early data show that uh, those organizations using body cameras uh, seem to be getting great results. Fewer complaints against the police, fewer use of force incidents, everybody seems to behave better, suspects, police officers, uh, but the, the, it's very, very important that we strike the right balance uh, between transparency and privacy. And uh, we have to get our policies and procedures right. We need to work with civil liberties groups, we need to all come to the table and, and talk about uh, striking that proper balance. Okay. Chief Johnson? You know, I think the, the, the greatest question is, is what's the return on investment? Because we're talking about the public's money funding these programs, but yet we're also talking about an unfunding in mental health, in substance abuse, in, in educational opportunities for youth. And so I think they have a role in policing. Uh, I think they have value, but I don't think that we've, that we've fully answered the question, uh, do they improve public trust? We know that they improve accountability for officers and for the community, but does it improve public trust? And so right now we're in a research project with the Police Executive Research Forum to try to do just that, find out if we can quantify public trust in the deployment of body cameras in our communities. 
Now, what I'd like to do now, would you like to comment on that one, Mr. Yeah, um, I would just note that there's a relationship between, obviously, accountability and trust to the extent that the public perceives more accountability um, and accountability in ways that run both ways. So in, to the extent that body cameras can exonerate police officers, uh, can clarify or make, uh, make uh, clear their behavior, their actions, uh, I think the public wants that too. They don't want to merely know those instances where there's uh, the excessive use of force. And so the point being here is I don't believe that there's there's a large group of people who believe that the technology alone will solve this problem, but where we have so many instances where the public is left literally with dead bodies, no answers, and no, um, no means of determining what happened other than a, a police report. We need more than that. And what I'd like to do with our remaining few minutes is have each panelist make a statement. You can highlight some points that you made earlier or talk about something that we didn't cover. And I'll start with you, Mr. Brooks. Well, first, I, I really just want to um, extend a word of appreciation to, to all of you for having this conversation. Uh, it is a difficult conversation, and it occurs at a very difficult moment in our contemporary history. Uh, but the fact that we're having it, and that we're having it now, and the fact that we're willing to have it speaks to our will and our capacity to bring about the kind of reform that many people in this country are looking to us to deliver. I believe that uh, ensuring independence, uh, independent prosecutors, certainly body cameras, the passage of the In Racial Profiling Act, a shift, a seismic shift, if you will, uh, in the modality of policing uh, is important. But it's also important to note this. The overwhelming majority of members of this profession honor their badges, they honor their oaths, Many of us would not be here, would not be doing what we're doing, would not for all of you doing what you're doing. We don't know the number of instances in which um, many of us avo have avoided harm because of the work that you do. When young people and when members of the NAACP and when members of this citizenry in this country call upon this profession to do more, it is simply with the expect expectation that more can be done and that we all collectively are well able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chief Johnson. You know, everybody in this room is a, is a leader in the policing profession. And so I think the takeaway for me today is, is to, to take this conversation and the conversations that have been going on through this whole conference and really focus on how can we effectively impact change? How can we lead the organization how can we lead to achieve the, the results that our communities are expecting and, and rightly so demanding? And how we can successfully lead our cops that are clearly doing a very difficult job under extraordinary conditions in, in some pretty particularly uh, dangerous environments in, in some cases. But I also think that a real takeaway is uh, much has been said about other governmental systems and society systems that are in need of improvement and accountability also. And so it is good to focus on the police, it is good to focus on accountability, but I think there's a time now for a National Crime Commission to look at everything related to the criminal justice system, not just the police. Look at prosecutions, look at probation and parole, look at reentry, and look at diversion and, and keeping people out of the penitentiaries when rightfully so. Because if we only focus on the police, we're, o we're only gonna be partially satisfied with improvements that are made in the criminal justice system. Chief O'Toole. Uh, I think that in my years in the business, this is the most difficult time. It's the most challenging time. But I think we should capture this as an opportunity. Um, I don't think we should resist change and reform. I think we should embrace it. I think it's an exciting time. Um, we have to work in collaborative approaches if we'll succeed. Um, and, I, and not only in, in terms of a National Crime com Commission, but we shouldn't be going along parallel tracks. We shouldn't have Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice going along parallel tracks to, to resolve some of the complicated issues we're all facing. I think we need to support our officers in the field. We need to give them the tools and the guidance they need to succeed at this point. Uh, they're counting on all of us, and if we're going to be effective uh, in our policing agencies, 
they're the ones who will make us effective. Uh, so as police chiefs, we need to set the agenda and give them the support that they need. Ms. Gupta. It's hard to go last because everyone said what I would have wanted to say, but I, um, I think that this is a remarkable moment, as challenging as it is, and against a backdrop of a much bigger set of conversations that are happening, as, as we've all talked about on criminal justice and housing and education and the like. And I just want to say this is, I think, the first time that the head of the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department has been invited uh, uh, to speak before the General Assembly. And to me, that's a testament, really, to all of you in this room. Uh, the fact is that you've been sitting here, you've been engaged, and I've seen the agenda and the panels, and these are, you are rolled up your sleeves the last several days on the, some of the hardest questions, and I am grateful to you. I think that communities around the country are grateful to you for your leadership, for going to the hard questions. We don't always agree. Uh, many of you may not agree with each other on various things, but the fact is, is that this moment is a moment that we cannot let go. Uh, and I think that the work that has been happening here at the IACP over the last several days is a testament to the commitment to justice and to figuring out paths to justice and public and officer safety that are going to be with us for another generation uh, in the face of many great challenges. So I thank you all for your commitment and for, for having us here today. Thank you to all of you for having this important discussion with me and our several guests. Thank you. Appreciate your time.